the foundations of if you have a, the blue book or if you're listening to the archives and you got the blue book um and here's again why I think it's good. You can have notes or whatever else, but especially in tomorrow night's training, we have a lot of um, – sometimes I put questions in that is answered by the actual message that I give. So um, you know the courses are all free and all that kind of stuff, but the um, the workbooks – Take time to write things down. Take time to listen to the Spirit of God. Take time to um, let Him speak to you. I love you. That's why I produce some of these, and we'll, we'll, we'll keep doing them better and better. But I, I've done this for years because to interact, to to you're, you're you're with the living Christ right now. You're with the Spirit of God. He's your teacher. He's to guide you and remind you. So this is a, an interactive, uh, it's not just my voice, you know that. So don't forget in uh, all of these sessions and all the live ones and when you're listening, hey, pray it up. You watch. Some of you will give this. Um, you uh, sometimes will um, experience, uh, even if you're listening to the archives and that's how you're doing it, uh, distractions, things to keep you from it. You watch. There might be a little more push from the dark side to keep you from the depth of this. And uh, keep you from knowing all that you should know. And that's that's a dangerous thing. Well, we are back for the second hour tonight on the 25th of uh, March. We want to welcome all those who are live listeners tonight, those in the chat room. We deeply appreciate each of you that are actually, uh, thank you, Shane, and others, throwing up the scripture as I mentioned, and that's important for every point. We're going to give you constantly, we're going to give you Scripture, explain Scripture, and go over that, why it's the language of the Spirit of God. It's the Word of God. It is the food. It is the it is life to us. And even if God brings convictions, that's good. You know, if I step in something I don't want to step in, I want somebody to tell me to get out of it. And it's important. And it's very important. So, yeah, you might have to make sure you turn off alarms and turn off your cell phones and put them over here. Get away the text. I mean, do you do you want to be distracted or do you want to spend time? And I'm going to say this, too. If you want to, in the chat room, in the second hour, you can throw up questions. We'll try to answer that. But we have four pages to go through on the notes. So I'm going to begin. We're going to go through. It's called The Beginning. Foundations of Spiritual Warfare is the section. Uh, number one, the beginning, and it goes from A all the way down to O, and then we're going to deal with two, the Old Testament, three, the New Testament, four, the arrival of Jesus, five, the cross, six, the opposition overview. So we got a bunch of um, things to do here in this second hour. In the name of Jesus, we pray for everyone listening, both live and by the archives. God bless them, strengthen them. The Lord Jesus Christ, rebuke and crush and destroy all of the work of the enemy. Lord, grant victories and strength. Stretch out your hands ex- with extraordinary grace, empowering by the Spirit, bringing healing where it's needed, um, guiding into repentance of things for us to throw things of the world out, throw things of the flesh out and rebuke and resist and walk away from the devil's works and lies. Lord, grant victories, grant incredible victories in Jesus' name right now. Thank you. Keep me in your prayers. I love it. I love it when you do that, and I appreciate it. On that page, my page says number two, but yours. we had one earlier manual. It might be different, so I'm going by the titles. Foundations of Spiritual Warfare, point one, the beginning. A, God was there. (laughs) No question about this, right? Mark down Ezekiel 28. We were not there to see this. In Ezekiel chapter 28, we have this incredible picture. Some, Some try to say, well, that was just the king. No, the king wasn't an anointed covering cherub. Didn't walk among the fiery stones of God. No, this is the picture and historically interpreted and clearly put out, and I believe without every ounce of my being, it's a reference to the fall of Satan. Uh, The description of his perfection, until you find the verse that says this, until wickedness was found in you. Now that word, Hebrew word, a willed, violent insurrection. He willed it. He he, he, He knew what he was doing. Now, that chapter is about this. Please understand, God was there. God is infinite, meaning 
He has no beginning, no end. God is omniscient, uh, all-knowing, uh, omnipresent, everywhere present, uh, omni, you know, as far as potent, powerful, and I always like to say omni-relational. Now, it's very important for us to understand this. There's no question God saw, you know, and all this went on, but it's, again, it, it, it all begins inside Satan. It really does. I think the theologians have not stressed this enough, but it begins there. Where does sin begin? There. You read in First John, you read there in First John chapter 3, the devil's been sitting. He originated it. He started it. He did it first. He's been doing it from the very beginning. He's never stopped. That idea of sin, missing the mark. Now, that's one Greek word, hamartia. But there's a number of Hebrew words and a number of Greek words that give reference to sin as willful, as violent, as very radically evil. And clearly, uh, it was, and, and God was there. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. No question about that. God was there. Uh, B, man was there. Look at Genesis chapters 1 and 2. It gives us the picture of the beginning. God, by special act, by special act, created mankind, bara. So this is, um, we read that in, in Genesis 1, John's Gospel chapter 1, the first chapter in Colossians, and the first chapter in Hebrews. It all speaks of the same thing. God created. John's Gospel, chapter 1, Christ, the Word was with God, was God, is God, um, the Creator. Nothing was made without Him. So we have, we are created in the beginning. And again, I'll say this. There is no death in us. There is no disease in us. There is no dying. There is no violence. There is no, we are created in, in, in blessed, absolute, you know, victory and um we were we were just that 100 percent until something occurred now this is important point c a word was given listen a word was given go back to genesis 2 and 3 before satan arrived you know arrived to bring on this battle mankind did not sin on their own theologians should understand this pastors we got to understand this um they we did not fall by ourselves. We did not originate sin. We joined it. So in Genesis 2 and Genesis 3, it's clear what God did. He gave the equivalent of one singular verse of Scripture. God said, hey, you know, don't. He told them what not to do. Don't take of that. He told them exactly what would happen. If you do, you're going to die. You know, don't eat of it. Don't touch it. And listen, don't let Kabbalists and mystical writers turn this into anything else. We're dealing with the fact that um, God was telling them directly, don't do that. And he gave them a scripture, and that one singular scripture could have been a point of victory, could have preserved them. It was powerful. God preempted the warfare. God's way ahead of Satan's warfare, always. Always remember that. He's always ahead, no matter what Satan's doing. God's ahead, and God will give you a heads up. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you. God was giving a heads up. Remember the churches in Revelation where he told one church, hey, the devil's coming. Be, you know, get right. The devil's coming to put some of you in prison. God knows how to give you a head up. And if you're walking with him in prayer and daily you're walking, you're going to get a heads up when bigger things come your way so you can stand. There's times God will give you a word, a scripture in advance, a word of God in advance. And by having it in your life, like in Matthew chapter 4, Satan came engaging Jesus. What did Jesus use? Do you know how powerful the word of God is? He quoted out of the book of, De uh, of Deuteronomy three times. He quoted scripture right back at Satan's face and stood his ground. You can't stand your ground. I mean, truly, there's no standing of ground without scripture anyway. All of our standing is based on the word of God that we would know, the truth that would be embedded in us. So the truth is this. A word was given in advance to protect and secure and shield them. Notice the interaction between Satan and, and, and Eve. Notice how Satan attacked that. Did God really say? Notice how he marred God's character. That's how he uses those arrows today against you. It's, he does the exact same thing. 
And she quoted the, the scripture. She quoted it, but she didn't hang to it. She didn't hold to it. She didn't stand with it. She departed. Adam departed from it and, it, and it and embraced an exchange. Notice that it was an exchange. It wasn't that they just departed from God or departed from the word. They exchanged God for Satan. They exchanged the word of God for the word that came out of Satan's mouth. They believed him instead. So that's why I'm saying, point A, God was there. Man, point B, man was there. Point C, the word was given specifically for that battle. D, God set them up for victory. God set them up for victory. Very important. That's what God does with the scripture now. He sets you up for victory. I believe that. That's why the the more you learn and the more you get embedded in your life and, and the more you grow that way, God is setting you up. When you have battles, the Holy Spirit can bring up the word of God that's in you. He reminds you of what you have, not what you don't have. Embed the Word of God in you and let the Holy Spirit bring it to your mind in the middle of battles, in the middle of your questions, in the middle of your prayer. Well, let me just mention this quickly here. I uh, want to welcome everybody because we have new folks. We have more folks coming in the second hour. And you don't have to have the workbook, but it's going to be helpful. I'm going point by point by point, giving you more to add into it, giving you resources to add into it. So other than that, the whole 12 weeks is free. But um, if you get a hold of the manual, it'll be helpful to you. You can use it. I've got training exercises, homework, other things in the workbook for you. So we hope that um, you might get a hold of that. The archives will be up usually about a week or two later, though. The archives will be up. Uh, we'll see if we can get up sooner than that. But the archives for each each of these live nights, they'll, on the website where the notebook is listed and where the course is listed, we'll begin to put up the archives of uh, these. Because I know that... Um, Listeners can be anywhere from 50 to a few hundreds, but those who listen later can be thousands and thousands. So for many of you listening later, again, the prayers are for you. God's presence is there. Let me get back down to point D on that page. God's, I believe that all that Jesus taught the disciples before he commissioned them, he's giving them the word of God. He's giving them, preparing them, but I believe this, for victory for the deep experience that we have um, in Christ. So it's very important that we really know this, and it's very important that it's all about victory, and that, that should give you motivation to get in the Scriptures deeply. E, under E, there's no fall of the human race without temptation. The temptation came. Maybe you could mark down 2 Corinthians... You ready? 2 Corinthians chapter chapter 11. When you take a look at chapter 11, and it's, it's actually verse 3. If you look at Genesis chapter 3, and then look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. You know what it says there in verse 3? Paul was concerned, he was afraid for them, that the serpent, the same one, the deceived deed, look how he connects this that the serpent that deceived Eve by his cunning um, was going to lead their minds, were gonna, was going to bring deception into their minds and, and draw them away from their pure and sincere, sincere devotion to Christ. So look at verse 3 of 2 Corinthians 11. It's connected to Genesis chapter 3. It's very important. It's very important. Because what Satan did right there in chapter 3 is what Paul, by the Spirit of God, is saying in Second Corinthians chapter 11. He's saying that's the exact same kind of warfare. The same one that was there. And so it's very important that we notice that this warfare... Um, that began the garden is the warfare that you and I experience. The Satan that engaged in the very beginning is the Satan that engages right now. No fall of the human race without temptation. Satan is called the tempter. Point F. The engagement was real. 
And that, in Genesis 3, you take a look at it again, and you'll see where it's really Satan. It's really, he's really there engaging, really there uh, communicating. He's, he's got an assignment. He's got a job. So it's, you know, it's very important. Forget about the skeptics and those who aren't saved and those who are doubters. And, you know, they're not going to help you. You got to come down to biblical halathia, truth, reality. Satan was really there engaging the human race. He helped bring the human race down. Now that import that's important because warfare right now is an engagement. You know, arrows that he sends, or temptation that he brings, or whatever level. Even with Job, wasn't that a wasn't that an engagement? Satan caused that disease, crumbling of house, all kinds of things. And behind that was Satan attacking um, believers. And it's very important to know that temptation is inevitable, but not res- you know, but it's not something you can't resist. Temptations will come from the old flesh stuff in the world, but from the devil too. And again, in Christ, we have everything we need to be strong, to grow, to develop. Um, and to become very, very... So we got to understand that all spiritual warfare will be a real engagement. Hey, if you're doing deliverance with somebody and demons manifest and you command them to come out, that's a real engagement. If you've got some night where you feel deeply, darkly oppressed and you rebuke in the name of Jesus, get out of here. I command you to get out of here in the name of Jesus. And you stand and, and you resist the devil and you know he flees away and all of a sudden you feel the power of God. And that's real engagement. Satan and the demonic realm is is really out there suppressing the church, silencing the church, um, even trying to move believers back into some kind of bondage and, and slavery. It's real engagement. So is using the authority of Christ. So is having the armor of God on. So is resisting the devil. So is standing there and quoting the word of God and standing in our freedom and, and, and having the joy of the Lord. Well, point G is he's a fallen cherub, Ezekiel 28. I want to say this under this point. It is God that accurately and definitively defines who Satan is. He is a fallen cherub, and I refer to him like that a lot. But let me say this. He's not only a fallen cherub, um, he's now called Satan. Satanus, adversary. He's now called the devil, Dablos. He's called in Revelation 12 the dragon, the ancient serpent. He's called a serpent. He's called a tempter, a destroyer. So it's important to understand how God defines Satan, how God defines the demonic realm, and how God describes to the believer they are um, our enemies. Very important. Point H, the area of communication again. Mark down Matthew chapter 4. He says, you know, Matthew chapter 4, it's very important. And it's very important to understand that there was an engagement, right? Where the warfare came directly from Satan face to face. Sometimes you're going to experience spiritual warfare in that sense to where there's going to be lies and things in your head and things that are contrary to the character of God, contrary to the word of God, contrary to the will of God. And guess what? Guess what? That's a tremendous indicator that something's coming straight, straight from Satan himself. Very important. Very important. Did Jesus communicate? Yeah, he out loud quoted the word of God, made a stand. You can quote the word of God out loud sometimes. When you have spiritual warfare around you, everything's going around you, there's times you can quote the word of God out loud. You can put yourself in praise. You can read the word of God out loud. Take your stand. I think that many believers, when they learn the points of victory, can really find victory a lot quicker Um, instead of being under all the battle for so long. Let me continue. Point I. You you realize he's the father of lies. In the Gospel of John, Jesus tells us he's the father of lies. Lies is, is what he did in the garden. 
And it's it's all about that in counterfeit doctrine and, and what Satan's doing with the coming Antichrist and the very end of the age and globalism and all the rest. So it's it's all about lies. Point J. Are feelings involved? Hey, spiritual warfare wise, you might feel like God's not around. Where'd you, where'd that come from? You might feel like God doesn't love you anymore. Where'd that come from? You might feel like what you try to do for Christ is no good. Let me ask you, are those the arrows of the enemy lying to you? As a matter, matter of fact, I pray that the Spirit of God will make you aware as you're going through this part of any lies Satan has thrown at you that you've allowed to stay in your head that have uh, brought some defeat to you. What do you do with lot When you identify lies that have come from the enemy, identify them as number one, Number two, renouncing, rejecting, in a sense, throwing out of your mind, throwing out of your life the lies of the enemy, rebuking it in the name of Jesus, and replacing it with the Word of God. Remember Romans chapter 1, where humanity has exchanged the truth of God for a lie. When you're finding victory in the middle of battle, you are exchanging any lies of Satan for the truth of God. Satan and dark powers bring oppression when lies are held on to. When we renounce them, reject them, get them, and then we embrace the truth of the Holy Spirit brings blessing and joy, and um, it's vital. That is vital in our walk, in our growth, in our development. And so you might need to do that tonight. May the Holy Spirit show any of us that if there are any lies, even from the past, what others have said where Satan meant to use somebody, any lies, Lord, I want to face them, I want to reject them, I want to throw them, I want them out, I rebuke them in the name of Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, give me the word of God that will is the opposite of Satan's lies so I can hold on to the truth and believe the truth. And I'm going to say this, God's presence and power comes in and through his truth, where Satan, he has access when we hold on to or accept his lies. Important for us tonight, exchange the lies. I don't care if they came by thought through somebody else, through your feelings. In the name of Jesus, renounce him and, then, and, and just cling to the word of God, and uh, you, you will find a tremendous exchange. And actually, that's point K where there's an exchange. And that happens even as you're reading the Bible. There's times God brings conviction of sin. We repent of that. We yield to the truth. And guess what? That's an exchange. When we come to Christ, there's an exchange. Uh, the old life for a new life. A life of sin for a life of righteousness. A life dominated by the law of sin and death. Instead, now we have a life dominated and empowered by the law of the spirit of life in Christ. Once we are in his authority under Satan's authority in his kingdom, his reign. Now we're in the rule and the reign of Christ. So as we grow in Christ, when we're learning more and we're throwing out false concepts and lies of the enemy and lies that came through the world and all the rest, truth continues to bring a deeper relationship in Christ. And that's important. It'll be a constant exchange. And I think that's what, mark down there if you want, um, Mark down there if you want, Colossians chapter 3. It begins with saying, you know, about our new life in Christ, hidden with God in Christ. Um, it then tells us what to put off, and then tells us what to put on. See the picture? You're a believer. You're set free. The Spirit of God lives in you. All the resources are yours. All the promises are yours. And now, Colossians chapter 3 God's going to tell you because your new life in Christ is is clear and sure. Okay, now, put off. You know, completely slay. Get out of your life. Get rid of, and look at what it lists. A good thing to do tonight or this week before next week is to look through chapter 3. Say, Holy Lord, may the Holy Spirit right now just show me. Whatever I need to put off, put out, get rid of, utterly you know, the Greek word means to utterly slay. And then, as you do that, you don't stop there. Then you put on. Put on. Clothe yourself with Christ. 
put on what God wants you to put on. So it's an exchange constantly. And meaning, you know, more and more getting rid of the world, the flesh, the devil, and more and more of the word inside of you, the spirit of God taking reign and rule, your confidence being built in Christ, and so forth. Very important. Let me mention also in the beginning, the fall of the human race, it involved the Spirit of God leaving. Our spirit became dead to God. Now, our human spirit was alive, but it was dead to God. Psychologically and emotionally and uh, physiologically, down to our DNA, everything changed. You know why? You know why? Romans chapter 8, which I'll constantly mention to you, tells us that the sin nature that we acquired... If we're not saved, if we have not the Spirit of Christ, we're none of His. If we're not saved, the Spirit, the, the, that our Spirit is dead to God, the sin nature is the living operative power. It's the law of sin and death. It's hostile to God. It doesn't want to submit to God. Uh, it can't. Fallen mankind at the core of our being, spiritually and then physically from the DNA up, we are not only just broken, not only just that if we sinned, hurting, all the rest, but it's because of real, a real change that occurred. In salvation, now I mentioned this, the fall of the human race brings about, now notice at the bottom of your page, the sin code, Romans 8. I call it the sin code, it's the, the Greek word sarx, meaning this sin operating presence, the law, the operating rule before coming to Christ is the law of sin and death. Um, under under point N, I mentioned also the death code. The wages of sin is death. They're inseparable. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15, the concept of sin and death and Satan are all connected. And under point O, I have down that the rights of Satan, the rights of Satan, Colossians chapter 1, verses 10 through 12. That in getting saved, coming to Christ, being born of the Spirit of God, we have been rescued. We have been then transferred, ripped up out of the domain, the real domain of Satan. Really done. Really, it's really done. And we have now been planted into the basileia, the rule, the reign of Christ. You are a believer who is now in the kingdom of God. Um, Satan no longer has rights. Now he tries to get them. He tries to bring temptation. Doesn't mean he doesn't act. But the fact is, as a believer in Christ, you the 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 law of sin and death has been severed, rendered powerless, Romans 6, rendered powerless. A new life, a new power is in you. That's the dominant power, the new indwelling power, the living Christ, the new nature, the Spirit of God is inside of you. Hallelujah is right. I love that in the uh I love that in the uh chat room. And I hope that you're saying that because I'm sitting here, I'm blessed. I am I'm really telling you right now the spirit of God here this see when I go over the teaching it brings a reminding. I have done this years after years after years. I love it. I love it. I love to be reminded of the living words of God. They are inseparable, I believe, inseparable from our relationship to Jesus. All right, point two, uh, under that section, foundations of spiritual warfare. Point number two. Let me just mention point number two and three, the Old Testament and the New Testament. I'm just giving you a panoramic view here. Point number two, the Old Testament. We'll take a look, Genesis 3. Who engaged mankind in the beginning? Satan did. Diablos, uh, the ancient serpent, he did. Who engaged Job and caused all the trouble? Obviously, no question about it, Satan did. What about all the tribes that were around Israel, the Hittites, the um, Amorites? Who were they worshiping? Moloch and Baal and demon gods and demon, you know, and then, yeah, we go to the whole thing. Uh, we have the Nephilim issue the reason for the flood, the flood was an act of God, a war, a destruction of Satan's attempt to change everything. That brought about, a, um, at that time anyway, a destruction of the Nephilim that had gone global. Most people don't understand this. The whole Nephilim issue went global. What was the reason for the flood? Don't take it out of context. 
Mankind became wicked, yes, in their sin, in their connection, but the Nephilim were there, and they were being led and altered and pl- everything. Everything was involved in that. It's, it, but that's why the flood had to be universal, and it had to go to all the places around the world where the Nephilim had embedded demonization, human sacrifice. I mean, it's all there. You can go to Second. Kings chapters 21, 22, 23, when Manasseh opened the doors to the demons, look what occurs. Josiah had to come. You can go to um, Ezekiel chapter 8 and see that even the prophet didn't know that underground, deeply hidden, was a real satanic coven. Blood sacrifice, all the connection, was being developed. I mean, the Old Testament's packed. The, the the Goliath, the Philistines, the massive demonization of tribes, families, clans, nations that were demonically uh, possessed and saturated and and would would be driven to fight against Israel. Even the king of Moab. Listen, in the Old Testament, now most people don't even remember this stuff from Sunday school, whether it was taught or not. In Kings, the king of Moab, when they were losing to Israel, sacrificed his own son on the wall to a demon god, and dark powers came down on his soldiers. They went into a frenzy, and they defeated Israel. They weaponized the dark powers. They worshipped the dark powers. They were indwelt by the dark powers. So the Old Testament spiritual battles were related to demonic presence, demonic demons, Satan's attempt to constantly annihilate what God was doing. Did you know that God created, initiated the nation Israel? And that was to be his entrance back in. That's God breaking in. They're going to get the word of God, the prophetic word. There's going to be a, you know, a God beginning to be operative and manifesting. And through that would come ultimately the bloodline of Christ and Christ himself. But look at the battle. Look at the warfare. Now, let me give you quickly number point number three, the New Testament. And again, I'm going to mention again, 1 John 3, 8. The reason the Son of God appeared, manifested, that is, he was eternally in the heavens. This is God, eternal. And the, the Logos, who was with God, was God, is God, he became flesh. But the reason he, he came here was to I mean we read John's gospel 316 God so loved the world absolutely you know he he so loved the world he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life absolutely verse 17 he didn't send his son in the world to condemn the world he sent his son in to save the world God's more interested in saving the world he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked we read in Ezekiel God's not willing that any perish but that all come to repentance we read in the third chapter of second Peter, right? Well, we also have to have in our minds that the reason the Son of God, Christ, came, the reason was to destroy the devil's work. To destroy. New Testament, I'm going to give you, concerning the, um, this is a big point too, tonight, the arrival of Jesus, the arrival of Jesus himself. This is point four in your notes under Foundations of Spiritual Warfare. The arrival of Jesus, and I'm going to probably give you uh, five points to this. It's very important. It's on the notes already there. A, the arrival of Jesus was a threat. How do we know this? The arrival of Jesus was a threat. Mark down Revelation 12. Remember now that Revelation 12 is a huge huge revelation of the of the person of the nature of the agenda of satan past present and future he's referred to there as Diabolos and satanus he's referred to there as the ancient serpent the devil satan so forth the adversary the destroyer but he's also referred to as the dragon seven times and if you read revelation 12 you're going to read about israel and it, it, it being, in a, in a sense, collectively, the, the, the one prepared, of course, the Virgin Mary being um, the, co- the cause of the conception, the Spirit of God, um, the incarnation. 
the Christ child. Take a look at Revelation 12. Look what it says about the dragon. The idea of dragon is the full manifesting presence of Satan. The Spirit of God paints an accurate picture. The idea of Satan and his full operating work is huge. He's, I'm not calling it, the scripture calls him Megos, a huge red pyros, you know, dragon, dracon. That's what he's called. And in Revelation 12, look what it says concerning the Christ child. He was there already prepared. Did you notice this? He, he was able to identify the Christ child. He knew who it was. And he was there for one reason. The dragon, Satan, showed up there to destroy him, to devour him, to annihilate him. That's warfare. Satan came to annihilate the Son of God. Now, you read in the context quick, because Revelation 12 is a quick panoramic view. It says he was snatched up to God, right? Look at it. The word snatched, you know what that word is? Same used in 1 Thessalonians 4. The dead in Christ will rise first. We who are alive will be harpezo, uh, snatched up away, caught up away. The idea of a superior, powerful force. Jesus lived sinlessly. He was without sin, died on the cross, cross, rose from the dead, just like the scripture prophesied. Matter of fact, a thousand years prior to the resurrection, Psalm 16. Christ, the Holy One, would not see decay. The The declaration of the resurrection is in Psalm 16, a thousand years before Christ came. And in Revelation 12, we have the picture that Satan, full force, is there to destroy the Christ child. Look what he tried to do with all killing all the babies two years old and younger. Remember? There's even a prophecy about Rachel and the, and the you know crying out. So that's why it's very important to understand that um, Revelation 12 is an enormous revelation of who Satan is, how he operates, and, and um, what he's done past, what he's doing now. He's attacking, he, you know, his goal is to, was to attack Israel. His goal is to attack the body. Anyone who believes in Jesus, holds to the testimony of Jesus, and is committed to the word of God, that's who he wants to go after. It, this is the chapter that shows that Satan, operating presence, wants to lead the whole world. He has a global, he's a globalist. Going to lead the whole world astray. Revelation 12. So I'm telling you something. If you want to understand reality, truth, the, the worldview, God's revelation of what the world's all about, you know, even if the political leaders and, and all, they don't understand. Satan is, operate, is operative amidst governments and economics and military and uh, spiritual lies and confusion and counterfeiting going on. Why? Well, look at Revelation 12. The dragon, the ancient serpent, Satan, the devil, He's coming and is here to lead the whole world astray. He couldn't destroy Christ when he was born. He couldn't do it in the temptation. He couldn't, you know, even at the cross, sinless, Satan had no rights. Jesus said, the prince of this world now stands judged. He has nothing in me, right? Remember that in Gospel of John? The prince of the world? That's he, Jesus lived knowing that. When he was having dinner with the disciples, he knew Satan entered the room. The disciples didn't. The more you become aware in Christ by the word of God, the more you're going to be aware when he enters into the, you know, people think, well, he can't enter the church building. Baloney. If there's rights, if he's coming to attack, and if, listen, if a, if a, believer that gives a, a foothold to the devil in their life, or if a non-believer that is demonized is away, if they walk into the building, who do they carry in? The demons don't stop and say, oh, let me jump off, and you go in there, and when you come back out, I'll be here waiting for you. That's not how it works. Can you imagine, there's the physical God in human flesh. They're in a fellowship of eating together, joy. They're utterly unaware. Jesus is instantly aware. That's why I'm going to tell you this. Clearly from Scripture, Satan never outwits God. It's always the Lamb of God running circles around the ancient dragon. 
Jesus is the victor. Jesus is your savior. Jesus is your king. Jesus is your God. Jesus is your Lord. Jesus is uh, your protector. Jesus is the one that gives you the awareness. He gives you the spirit of God. He's inside you. He says, I'll never leave you. Amen? The arrival of Jesus meant a great threat to the dark side. Satan prepared for him, point B, was there ready, point C. Satan wanted to kill Jesus, point D. Satan sought to convert Jesus. That's in Matthew 4. The audacity of the dark side. Remember what Jesus, I mean, here's Satan now coming, quoting scripture back out of, see, I don't believe, I believe by will, Satan and demons never quote the scriptures correctly, but also by nature. The Holy Spirit always quotes his own word correctly. The spirit of truth unleashing the word of truth, right? Because of the Son of God who is the truth, right? Well, the truth is, in all of my experiences with demon-possessed people and whatever else and seeing the scriptures, Satan is always showing that he's twisting scripture. That's how it is in cults. That how, that's how it is in the New Age. That's how it is with the alienologists. That's how it is with Helena Blavosky and Alice Bailey and the Course in Miracles and all the other junk. They use scripture just like Satan quoted it. Who knows scripture better than most Christians? Satan. Who knows prophecy better than most Christians? Satan. To twist it, to misuse it, and also preempt, I mean, he. how did he know to be there for Christ? How does the Antichrist know to be there in Revelation 19 at the second coming? I think Satan, and that side, adjusts their agenda based on what God says he's going to be doing in prophecy, because they know it's true. They know they've never been able to stop, never been able to stop God in fulfilling prophecy. So that's the vital issue. When we talk about you know, point four, the arrival of Jesus, this means everything, right? Everything. Now, get ready. Point number five, that's the next page if you're using the notebook. Point number five, I want you to mark down Colossians. Colossians chapter two. Take your time. Praying for you. You pray for me. We're almost done here tonight, so hang on just a few more moments tonight. Going fast, I know. Colossians chapter 2. Have you read verse 15? Having and having, this is about Christ on the cross. Having spoiled, or the word means to to disarm, the idea of uh, coming in and just taking all the weaponry away. Having disarmed, spoiled the principalities and powers, two words that describe the demonic realm. He, Christ, made a public display of them. He forced their exposure. He forced showing who they really are. He forced the showing the reality of, of their presence and their working and their and their in, in, in lives. He forced that. I mean, mark down right here also, Mark chapter 5. When Jesus Christ was just approaching where the demon-possessed man was, guess what happened? The, demon, the demons inside knew, was aware, led the man out, and fell down, screaming out. They knew who he was. In all the deliverances, every demon knows Really, I don't care about, you know, atheists and everybody else can sit around and lie and use excuses. But the demon, all the sum total of demons, they know exactly who the real Christ is. God in human flesh, Savior of the world, sinless, the one with authority, the king, the fulfillment, the, the Messiah. They know this is Yahweh Adonai in human flesh. That's why the demons were terrified. That's why demons coming out of people... In Samaria, Acts chapter 8, they went out with screams. They're real, my friends. Spiritual warfare is real. The fall of the human race is real, and it didn't happen without a fallen cherub, Satan, Diablos, dragon. There is no globalism. There is no future antichrist, false prophet, deception, none of that. Even, and this is something we'll talk about, when Jesus says in Matthew that uh, hell was created for the devil and his angels. 
Now, if you're lost and you're unsaved and you're going to walk around rejecting Christ and you're going to spit in the face of grace, that's where you're going to end up. And by God's providence and His kindness and His outstretched arms to you right now, the Holy Spirit calls you to repent of that sin, repent of your lostness, turn away, turn to the living Savior. On the cross, Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Here's the Savior that loves you. He's there to bear your sin and conquer it, to bear death and conquer it, to conquer Satan's rights, to open the door to direct access to God and to the gift of indestructible, I like to call it indestructible immortality. Hallelujah. Well, in Colossians 2.15, foundational verse, Jesus Christ by the cross disarmed, spoiled, rendered powerless the powers and authorities, he made a public, public spectacle, triumphing over the whole dark side by the cross. Things that demons don't like to hear. Number one, the name Jesus, spoken by a real believer. Any reference to the cross, spoken by a real believer, they don't like because we know what it means. And the mention of the blood of the Lamb, the blood of Christ, they don't like because they, by you know, spoken by a believer because we know what it is and we're covered. You and I as believers are saved and uh, indwelt by God's presence, protected by God, given authority, and we have the Spirit of God and the blood of Jesus. The cross, the blood, Christ has everything to do with our our walk and our relationship. It has everything to do with our access. Do you know right now, by knowing Christ, you know God? You can just close your eyes because the Spirit of God's in you. You have the Spirit of adoption. You cry out, Abba, Father. Romans 8, great, great, great revelation there. So you can say, Hallelujah, and praise God, and bring worship, and bring thanksgiving, and so on and so on. Amen? Well, I think it's, um, I think it's very, very vital in the context of spiritual warfare that we take our time. And so I'm not going to try to finish the foundation. We'll do that next Monday night. We'll go back to foundations of spiritual warfare and we'll go at point number six. A lot of things there, a lot of time. And then that goes all the way to the next page. So I'm going to open up in the last seven minutes to give you time for questions and everything else. Now, tonight is Spiritual Warfare Basics and Advanced for 12 weeks. This is week number one. And we've only gone through the introduction and halfway through Foundations of Spiritual Warfare out of the notebook. Tuesday nights is the other class, the other course. Satanic ritual abuse, occult crimes, the idea of intervention, investigation that's even deeper i mean what i mean by deeper it's three hours long well tomorrow night we won't have a guest but almost every single tuesday night we'll even have a guest expert on past victims on other people that deal that's that's um that's um tuesday night tonight throw up questions in the chat room if you'd like to now again you can send me questions in advance but send it to the email address, shattermailbox at yahoo.com. Shatter, S-H-A-T-T-E-R, shattermailbox at yahoo.com. Russ, may I ask, did you used to be one of New York's finest, a police officer? No, I was not. I have a friend, Hector, up there. Uh, we haven't met face-to-face, but Hector is a, a long-term, a long-time officer, and, but I, ha- I am not. I've been raised, and I've lived in the greater Akron, Ohio, Canton, Ohio area. Now, I was a police chaplain recruited to teach in police academy on occult crimes, satanic crimes, here locally, um, but uh, not, in, not in New York. And um, question comes in, what if someone can't believe? Here's the reason why. Um, the scripture says this. Faith comes from, this is Romans 10. Faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. How can they believe on whom they've not heard? So God gives the enablement of faith through the hearing and or reading. That's why we read in the Gospel of John. I think it's chapter 22. He says, these things were written that you might believe. And that by believing. So 
that you'd have eternal life. So believing is vital. But believing is is predicated on or is, uh, stands upon the fact that the Word of God comes. The Word of God is alive. So let me say this. Get in the Gospel of John. Look at it. That will enable you. Looking at what who Jesus is, reading the Word of God, it enables you to have faith. And you then have to believe. You then must believe. Uh, make that choice. Repenting of sin, renunciation, especially if you're coming out of the world of occultism, demons, witchcraft, anything else. Renounce all of that heavily and all of the powers and all the stuff with it and then turn to Jesus, receive him, accept him as Lord and Savior. Ephesians chapter 1 says, having believed, you'll be marked marked with the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. We'll look at a couple more questions here. Um, let me see if there's other things here tonight. Yeah, I refer to Satan as a chair fallen. Uh, go again to Ezekiel 28. He's considered the anointed cherub, the covering cherub um, in, in Ezekiel 28. Uh, that's why I refer to him as a fallen one. Um, like Michael is an archangel, always will be. I mean, Satan, in a, in a sense, is, a, is, a, is that covering anointed cherub, but, but he's desecrated his sanctuaries. He's completely altered, completely different. Jesus said no truth is in him. So God now has described him as Satanus, Diablos, dragon, serpent, tempter, adversary, murderer, liar. So that's what he's doing. He's describing his real nature now. But prior to the fall, before he actually changed, well, take a look, Ezekiel 28. Um, good, 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 good question. Uh, doesn't a chaplain imply that you must accept all religions? In the Army, I think that's how it works. Uh, where I was taken, as far as the local police department, absolutely not. Uh, and there's no way I would have done that. Uh, not a possibility. So uh, it was very clear what I was there and very clear when I rode with police officers and worked with them uh, when I was in the academy. Now, they did tell me, Russ, when you teach in a police academy class, when we allow you to do that, don't preach the gospel. So I said, okay, what if somebody asks me? what I believe in, and how do I stay spiritually strong or protected? Well, they said, well, if somebody asks you, then you, can, then you can share. So every time I taught in a police class when they allowed me to do that, I would pray, Lord, move on somebody, and every time it happened. So I got to declare my faith, got to lead folks to Christ, got to do deliverance ministry, um, and uh, bear witness to Christ until I needed to get out of there and um, broaden what needed to be done. Uh, so it's important, no matter where you're at, to um, seek to be seek to be um, faithful in all that you do. It's very important. There's a question that came in. Big question here it says: If some believers fall away, does that mean they were never saved? If not, how would you know about your assurance? Well, uh, let me get quickly, and then I got about a minute left here on the on the live. Um, just let me quickly say this that um, it's possible when you see people that say, well, I, was, I once went to church or I once was there, and they're, they're definitely not. I mean, you see them now. There's no spirit of adoption. There's no Holy Spirit in them, and it's very clear they're not for, with or, or for God. In First John, we read this in chapter 2. They went out from us because they didn't belong to us. In the Greek, it's a genitive, genitive of belonging. They went out from us because they didn't belong to us. For if they would have... Belonged, I mean, if they would have um, belonged to us, they would have stayed. But their going showed. So I will say this much, that um, it's possible for believers to stumble. It's possible for believers to backslide. It's possible for believers. That doesn't mean the Spirit of God leaves you. Now, I will not get into a big debate over the ultimate issue of falling away or non-falling away. The, the fact is, salvation is intended to save you eternally. Um, when Christ comes in, it's to be a permanent issue. And in, if you read John's Gospel 5 and 6, he's not going to lose any of them. The warnings concerning real falling away is real. And if anybody ever really fell away, you couldn't come back. You can't re-crucify Christ. So just giving you a quick little answer, God wants you to be assured. If you have the Spirit of God, and if you truly are born again, then God wants you to grow, and the more you grow, the more you'll be, you'll you'll experience a confidence in your walk, 
an absolute confidence. Um, I don't. I haven't sat around worried about my salvation in 38 years. I, I really haven't. I mean, when I got saved, that first couple of weeks, you wonder because you don't have any scripture. But once I learned the word, once I began to grow, once I, that is am my perfect no. Um, if we become aware of any sin in our life, we repent of that. So please, it's very important that um, we're not going to. Uh, um, we have a we have a fifty five hour theology class. We'll get into that sometime down the road. But most important, and I'll give you this also, Second uh, Book of Peter, ch- Chapter One. It refers to an assurance of your salvation by growing. By growing with the word, you become more confident about the salvation you have. The Holy Spirit bears witness deeply within. And man, as you grow and become stronger in the Lord, I, I'm just saying, you don't sit around worried about it. You're growing. You're, you're developing. And that's very important. We are down to the last 30 seconds. Um, very good. I appreciate that in there. We're going to close off the archives uh, recording here in a few moments. want to say that we're so glad that you're here for the first night. A lot of things to pray about, a lot of things to go over. But uh, I'm going to have to end because our hour is our two hours is up tonight. And we are now um, closing off the live. Good night. I love you. Keep us in prayer. On this course, I'll see you next week. If you're coming to tomorrow night's course, that begins at 730. Good night.